Thanks for listening to the Dune Steve Audio Fiction Magazine. And now here's your host, Big Anklevich. Now, I'm sure it'll stop as soon as he grows up, Santa. Well, let's hope so if he wants to make the sleigh team someday. And Rish Outfield. I just thought I found a way to, to fit in. You'll never fit in! You just got bossed. All right. Hi, everybody. This is Big Anklevich. And this is Rish Outfield. And is this the Doonstief Audio Fiction Magazine? That's right. Doonstief Audio Fiction Magazine. We are here with our annual Christmas episode. Did we make it in time for Christmas? Nah, probably not, but it's still the Christmas episode. Okay. Whether it made it in time or not. <laughs> So yeah, we've got a, uh, a Christmas-related story for you today. Last year, we uh, had no Christmas episode, like, ready to go. And so I quickly dashed down a few lines and called it a story, and we ran it. What was, um, what was that one called? Oh, oh sorry. I, if that's too difficult to question. Shoot. <laughs> Give me a second. Um... It was Santa, baby. Santa, honey. Dear Santa. Dear Santa. There you go. Yeah, I was going to say it was close to that, but I would never, ever name it Santa, baby. <laughs> Lies. <laughs> so close to Santa, baby. <laughs> anyway, so yeah, it was called Dear Santa, and uh, this year it was your turn. So you, instead of dashing down a couple lines right before we were about to read... You actually, like, sat down and wrote this. I remember you talking about this story at least a month or two ago, right? We, we went to that restaurant that had the heaters outside so you could eat outside in the winter. Oh, yeah. That was before it actually got cold. <laughs> I miss those days now, considering the walloping we're taking outside right now with the piles and piles of snow. But when the weather outside is frightful... The Dune Steve podcast is so delightful. You, your story is called The Present of the Christmas Ghost, right? Yes, no, there's no the. It's Present of the Christmas Ghost. Yeah. Oh, okay. Present of the Christmas Ghost. Hey! <laughs> uh oh. I didn't, I didn't realize. I remember thinking that was an awkward title. No wonder. It's because it's all reversed around. This is a, a portent of bad things. <laughs> It's like, oh, I just got it. Uh -oh. I should have got it a long time ago. I think that just shows how dumb I am. Anyways, so the not the present of the Christmas <laughs> ghost. It's by Rish Outfield. And do we want to do any adieu? Adieu, sorry. Adieu means something else. Yes, I, I'm, I'm ready for the goodbye, actually. Uh, oh, let's yeah? just okay. not play it. Uh, we'll talk about how bad the story is after the uh, episode. All right. I'm sorry, after the presentation. Uh, yeah, it's just something for, uh, for the holidays. All right. A little bit of holiday cheer. A cup of cheer for you. Have yourself one and enjoy the present. Oh, dang it. I keep saying the <laughs> right. present of the Christmas ghost. See you later on the other side. Folks. Okay. Present of the Christmas ghost. Do you know who you sound like right now? Alberta asked, a smirk on her face. Bill gritted his teeth. What? Just because I don't feel like working all day Thursday, I'm suddenly Adolf Hitler? That does seem a bit much, Jorge threw in, then returned his attention to his plate. Hush, George, Alberta said, pronouncing it George just like Bill did. And I wasn't going to say Hitler, she said, shaking her head like an impatient kindergarten teacher. Or none. Bill shook his own head back. Because a huge group of overspending, selfish parents and their fat, brain-dead, absolutely unsatisfiable kids need a ton of worthless presents, then I have to be at the coffee shop on Thanksgiving. Alberta nodded in empathy. Well, why don't you say you hate Thanksgiving then? 
since it's the day you're going to be stuck. No, no, don't confuse the issue, Bill said. This is all about Christmas. Nobody's out doing Thanksgiving shopping, buying dolls and Pokemons and video games for Thanksgiving. They were in a diner. It was just before closing, and Bill had had three cups of coffee with his chicken fried steak and potatoes. He sat on one side of the booth, while his friends Jorge and Alberta sat on the other, snuggling. Bill was a pretty smooth operator with the ladies, but his pal had jumped into the deep end with this girl. They were already talking about marriage, and not in a jokey, horrified way, either. Bill fixed his glare on Jorge, who had been slowly eating his pie and rice pudding. Too slowly. You haven't weighed in on this, Georgie. Christmas sucks, right? I, I don't want to take sides, he mumbled. Come on, you Puerto Rican Harry Potter, back me up on this. Christmas is a disgusting, greedy time, when you see America and Americans at their worst. And the worst day for all that used to be the day after Thanksgiving. But now they've moved Black Friday up to Thanksgiving, too. Ruining the one day where you could hang out with your family and watch football. To be fair, Jorge said, swallowing, you hate your family. He needed a haircut. And now he did look like Harry Potter. Too true. But I don't hate football. Or turkey. Or a day off. Alberta absolutely loved the holiday season. She had made that abundantly clear. The snow, the lights, the presents, the carols, the smells, the trees, even the sales and rancid TV specials. Bill knew this, but to hear the girl go on and on when he'd cringed at every sappy, overplayed holiday song played over the cafe's speakers had caused him to all but explode. Their waitress had disappeared during his colorful anti-Christmas rant, and since there were no other customers nearby, he was not at all embarrassed about it. Alberta turned to her boyfriend. He makes a point, she said, then amended. Not about Christmas, but about you taking a side. Jorge fidgeted, lifted his glass to take a drink, but there was only ice left. Look, I've had a bad Christmas or two here and there, but on the whole, I look forward to the holidays. I get to spoil my nephews and... The other day, I heard you complaining about candy canes, reminded Bill. Well, yeah, but everybody hates candy canes. Not me, Alberta said. Well, you can always have my candy cane, Jorge said with a toothy smile. And mine too, Bill said grumpily. Great, said the girl. Except I sort of meant it as a euphemism, Bill, Jorge told him. Oh... Well, you can still have my candy cane. Did you? Alberta asked. So, do you really like candy canes, then? Bill snorted, and they all laughed. He did fancy Alberta, don't get me wrong. But Jorge had been his friend for more than ten years, so he kept the euphemisms to himself. And that was weird. Ever since getting together with Jorge, Alberta had been a sort of co-best friend to Bill, which was not typical. Right now, though... She was acting more like somebody's mother instead of a best friend-in-law. Look, why do you even care? Bill asked her. It's not like I said you can't celebrate Christmas and all that. Because I want you to be happy. And Christmas is the most wonderful time of the year. And she said it with a straight face. Christ, I'd hate to see you around Valentine's Day. Oh, Valentine's Day sucks. She said. Finally, something we agree on, said Bill. Second worst holiday of the year. No, no, she said. Come on, they're nothing alike. Valentine's Day was a creation by the greeting card companies to sell merchandise and make people feel obligated to buy stuff for their wives. You're describing Christmas, you know. Alberta shook her head slowly, trying to process it. You never loved Christmas, even as a little kid? My grandparents were Jewish. My uncle was Mormon. Mormons celebrate Christmas, Jorge began. They thought it would be better to help the homeless and poor families instead of spend money on their kids. And Moody Nephew. Oh, I'm sorry, Alberta said. And she seemed actually upset. Eh, don't worry about it. I remember Christmas being a stressful time as a kid, 
Jorge said. But it's not anymore. Oh, yeah? Bill growled. Come by the coffee shop tomorrow around 8 p.m. and see if it's not stressful. Jorge just shrugged, but Alberta hadn't let it go. It just breaks my heart to think that anybody, especially a friend of mine, hates Christmas. Well, Bill said, not really sure if he should push it or not. Thanks. Suddenly, Alberta sprang to life. I've got it! What? Jorge asked. The waitress, doing nothing over by the register, looked their way. We're going back to my aunt's house right this minute. We are? Jorge asked, not making the connection. You and me and Bill are, she said. Why? Why? Both guys asked. I'm going to show you the spirit of Christmas. They had no idea that Alberta meant it, literally. They took Alberta's big Chevy up to Locust Lane, where old people went to die. The big old house at the end of the turn was her aunt's, who had gone out of town. The woman was in Florida, where she apparently went every Thanksgiving through December 1st. Alberta practically ran up the sidewalk and around the house, eager to begin whatever she had in mind. There was a hidden key atop the doorframe of the back door, and she let the three of them in. What are we doing here? Jorge wondered aloud. You'll see, she said, closing the door behind them. It was a nice house, with wood floors and three levels, probably built when men wore top hats, and there had only been one world war. She headed for the stairs. Uh, Let me try, Bill said. Albie, what are we doing here? When I was a girl, I loved to visit my aunt. She was all into spiritualism and stuff, big believer in all that. But my parents hated it. Wasn't allowed in their home, so... She led them all the way up to the attic, the old wooden door squeaking like something out of a horror movie. She flipped a switch, and a pair of dim fluorescent bulbs came on above their heads. The attic was pretty cozy, a place where kids would love to play, not fear going up into. Hey, you sure you want to waste your evening doing... Whatever this is? Bill asked. The question was to both of them, but mostly to Alberta. Of course, and it's not a waste. Why? He had to know. Why isn't this a waste to you? She closed the door behind them. Because I... There's this thing we learned about in literature class before I dropped out. She said. It's called a maniac pixie dream girl. He squinted at her. Was that a thing? And what's that? I'm that. That's what I am. She sounded proud. I don't know what that is, he said. And Jorge agreed with him. Yeah, me either. Well, it's awesome, believe me. Clearly. What religion are you? Alberta asked. Me? Asked Bill. Uh, I'm nothing. A A nihilist. What's that? It's... Bill paused. He actually didn't know. You know, somebody who doesn't believe in nothing. Come on, you must believe in something. Nope. Jorge was looking through all the old books, all the old encyclopedias on the walls, faded calendars and posters from bands he'd never heard of, like Cream and Ringo and the All-Star Band. But he listened to their conversation. She was searching for something on a bookshelf, tossing Bill a glance. No God? No God. What about, like, fate or destiny or true love? Nope. He knew it sounded jaded, but, well, there it was. I believe in true love, Jorge said, staring fixedly at Alberta. Uh Uh-huh. She said, not impressed. What about the Christmas spirit? Bill held his ground. It was almost fun to be stubborn about this. Uh, That was invented by Coca-Cola and Hollywood. No, no, Santa Claus was invented by Coke, the young woman said. Well, I don't believe in Santa Claus either. This was really bothering Alberta. She was looking in a cabinet, scanning its contents, while the two guys stood around awkwardly, not sure what they were being dragged into. 
Jorge flashed Bill a look, and they knew each other well enough to let the message, you gotta indulge her sometimes, what else you gonna do, pass between them. Ah, still here, Alberta finally said, removing something from the top shelf of the cabinet loaded with old puzzles and board games. She held it up for them to see. Here we go, Alberta announced, and grabbed a long brown box from the closet. She brought it out. It was a Ouija board, just like in the movies. She placed it on the little card table and opened the box. Jorge seemed taken aback. Holy cow, your aunt has one of those Ouija boards? They're pronounced Ouija? And no, this one belongs to me. She announced and grinned. Her smile took her from probably an 8 out of 10 to, well, whatever was way above an 8. Where the hell do you get something like that? Jorge wanted to know. Toys R Us, Alberta said. They sell it next to Scrabble and shoots and ladders. Right, laughed Bill, not believing her for a moment. Though it did say Hasbro on the box. Jorge's Catholicism instantly kicked in gear. Uh Uh-oh, should we be messing with that? Yes, Alberta said, and she was even more emphatic than usual. She started clearing a table in the corner of the room from all the old National Geographics and Life magazines it held. Jorge sighed. He knew that when his girl got a bee in her bonnet like this, that there was no stopping her. So he helped her move the table to the center of the room, brush off the dust from three folding chairs, and set them around the board. Are we really doing this? He whispered to her. Yes, she said at full volume. I really want Bill to believe in something. Bill shook his head. It was flattering that an attractive though possibly nuts, girl, cared about what he thought about something that was important to her. But that was not the same thing as being convinced. Why? Yeah, why? Jorge wanted to know, finding himself getting a little jealous. Because I love Christmas. I love the music, the lights, the snow, the TV shows. I love it all. And I hate all that, except for snow. Which you get even without Christmas... Everybody sit down, she said, and she and Bill did, though he had to take out his keychain and set it on the bookshelf, since the chairs seemed to be made for ten-year-olds. Can I just watch? Jorge asked, still standing. I've seen this in movies, usually scary ones. It's not going to be like that, George. Now sit, she commanded, and he obeyed. So we're going to fire this thing up, Alberta said, practically exuberant now. And you, my bearded friend, are going to have a change of heart about Christmas. It's going to, what, grow ten sizes bigger like in the cartoon? Bill asked, only slightly amused. But it was still amusement. Only three sizes, Mr. Grinch, but you've got the idea. I've got a better idea, Bill said. How about we don't do that? I feel all holiday cheery already. Mission accomplished. Nope. You, sir, are going to feel the Christmas spirit if it has to kick you square in the Wranglers. These are Levi's, Bill retorted, but he was willing to play along. He liked Alberta. She was fun and cute and always positive, and he had wished many a time that she had a sister or a cousin just like her. A twin would be preferable. She motioned to the table in front of them. Now scoot in close. Bill did so. He still found it necessary to add... Why are you so fixated on this again? Alberta paused to think about it. Those pixie dream girls really drive my professor out of her mind. And what are those? He asked. Like angels or fairies or something? She scooted her own chair up to the table. It's when there's a female character in a movie or a book that only exists to open up a male character's eyes or his heart. She doesn't have any will or goals of her own. That's what I am, Bill Stewart, your maniac pixie dream girl. He felt his ears burning at that, but only sat there, smiling. Well, I'm honored. Alberta chuckled, having gotten something out of the brown box and holding it in her hand. Her boyfriend was looking about the room, everywhere but at her or the Ouija board. Bill could tell something was wrong, and he wondered if it had been her saying she was his dream girl instead of a pixie whatever. George, she asked, gesturing to the chair. Jorge slowly turned, and there was nervousness in his eyes. Look, Albie, I've heard about these things, like, 
messing up people's minds, opening doors to, you know, bad places. Bill leaned in toward Jorge. You're scared? You don't still believe in this sort of thing. Well, yeah, we went to church when I was a kid and they'd say, well, what I just said. It's just a game, Alberta told him, but she clearly thought it was more than that. Jorge took a deep breath and nodded. He was in, but still looked at the box like it might be radioactive. So, you ask the board questions? Well, the spirit world. We make contact with the world beyond. She said it like it was a specific place, with capital letters. And see if we can talk to one specific person. Bill sighed. Both the others looked his way. What? asked Jorge. You really going to do this? Try to talk to Jesus Christ? Alberta wilted a little, as if insulted. Jorge added, I doubt he'd even speak English, Alberta. Hush up your mouth, George, she said, and he did. That's not what I had in mind at all. But you said the one face of the Christmas spirit. I, I, I figured... No, no! <laughs> Alberta laughed. I was thinking of someone a little more recent. The guys met each other's eyes. She raised her voice, proclaiming, We are going to try to contact... Ebenezer Scrooge! Bill had heard her right. Still, he said, What? Really? Jorge had to speak up. Uh, but Alberta... His girlfriend tossed him a, You really want to take me on right now, look? And he said, Nothing. Uh, it's fine. He seemed calmer now around the Ouija board, but that was relative. He was still too stiff, still out of his element. I saw this thing on TV years ago about the history of the holiday, she continued. Before Scrooge came along, Christmas was, you know, falling by the wayside. But after, people embraced it like crazy. I thought he was supposed to hate Christmas, Jorge said, like Bill. Yeah, but at the end of his life, he turned it all around, made it a point to fix it all. Okay, Madam Alberta, Bill said, and there was good humor, even enjoyment in his voice. Do your thing. She nodded, reached out her hands, grasped both Jorge and Bill, and gave their hands a squeeze. She began to intone, something in between a prayer and casting a spell. Oh, spirits. We come before you this day. Night, muttered Jorge. This night, Alberta went on, to speak with one among you in the great beyond, one who has crossed over. We put our hands on this sacred board. Bill looked down at the Ouija board, again noting the Hasbro logo on it. And evoke the afterlife. Uh, invoke, isn't it? Alberta all but growled releasing their hands and gestured to the pointer in the center of the board, a teardrop-shaped piece of raised plastic. Now, each of us put our right pointer finger... Index finger. Bill prompted, now thoroughly enjoying this silly game. Yes, index pointer finger on the blanchet and only put a tiny bit of pressure on it. They did so, Jorge still seeming uncomfortable but no longer scared. Blanchet, like the woman in the Hobbit movies? Bill asked quietly. That's what it's called, okay? Alberta said, but she wasn't entirely mad, just intolerant of more teasing. Now, don't press down, just loosely touch it. Run the pointer around the board and let the spirits direct your fingers. Let it go where it wants to go. They pushed the pointer around, letting it go up and down, right and left. Alberta once again began to chant. Pray? Please tell us, spirits, if you are amendable to speaking with us by signaling on the board. Once again, Jorge and Bill's eyes met, both aware that Alberta was not very good at this, but being good sports. Their fingers moved to the corner of the board where yes was marked. Yes! Alberta gasped. It said yes! The guys nodded. Bill hadn't moved it there, but was confident one of the other two had. Not that he would say anything. Alberta was positively beaming. Very good. She looked across the table at Bill. What was your ex's name? Mine? Bill asked. 
Uh, we called her Chesty Wendy. Will Ch- <laughs> She cleared her throat. Ahem. <clears throat> Will Bill's ex-girlfriend ever come back to him? The planchette again pointed out yes. Will she have chlamydia when she does? Jorge asked. Immediately, the pointer hit yes again. For that move, Jorge had been very much responsible. Funny, Bill said, and laughed. (laughs) Okay, enough, Alberta said, pushing her smile away. Let me talk to them. Don't move the blanchet. She raised her head up high, aiming at the ceiling. We ask you, O spirits, to open your doors to us and let us speak with the one who can help our friend understand the true meaning of Christmas. Spirits, we would like to speak to one of you, Mr. Ebenezer Scrooge, who lived in England in the 1700s? 1800s, Jorge whispered. In the 1800s. He was a banker or something, and he too spoke with ghosts. He said in his famous book, Can we speak with Scrooge, please? This time, the pointer moved to the bank of letters on the center of the board. S. P. E. A. K. I. N. G. Speaking. Alberta read. That sounds like an English person to me. Okay, Jorge muttered. But Bill thought it was a nice touch. He didn't believe in spirits, much less Ouija boards. But he wouldn't actually move the board pointer himself unless absolutely necessary. Mr. Scrooge, Alberta said, raising her voice to the attic ceiling. We have among us a friend, William Stewart, who... Uh, It's not William, Bill clarified. Bill's actually short for Billy. I am proud, just saying. All right. We have Billy Stewart with us, who doesn't believe in the Christmas holiday. The board did not comment on that. So I brought him here to talk to you. The pointer began to move. S. O. R. Sorry to hear that, Jorge read, making an almost laughing sound. I know, right? Alberta replied at her most lovable. We know you're an expert, sorry, we're an expert on the holiday, and that you used to be like Billy here, so we hope you'd say something to help him. The Blanchette began to move quickly from letter to letter. You're doing this, Jorge muttered, and both Alberta and Bill said, No, No, I'm not. At the same time. It spelled out, He thinks Christmas is... Humbug? Question mark. Yes, exactly! Alberta laughed, and Bill stared at her. This was really very sweet of her to go to all this trouble just to cheer him up. You need to, the pointer spelled, believe. Yeah, sure, Bill said, spoken with the conviction of a parent talking to a little, little kid. Suddenly, something shook the house, as though a big truck were driving past it on the freeway. The objects hanging on the walls rattled, and the fluorescent lights flickered. Oh, Bill breathed. Jorge's eyes got bigger. The three friends felt their fingers move the pointer back to the question mark again. What? Bill asked. What do you want? The lights went out. Something fell on the floor from a shelf, and Alberta let out a yelp. Ah! The lights came back on. They were no longer touching the pointer, but it vibrated on the board. Whoa! Bill said again. To their left, something made a sound. Like a person clearing their throat. (coughs) It was a ratty red plush doll. A Tickle Me Elmo. The thing that had fallen to the floor. Son of man, do you believe in me or not? It spoke. It was not a cute, high-pitched Muppet voice, but a rasping one with a distinct British accent. Jorge gasped. Alberta looked over in confusion, but Bill just smiled. This was, he figured, quite an elaborate hoax she was perpetrating, 
and it made him long for her. He hadn't been a good boyfriend in the past, but she was obviously one of those people who put extra effort into every birthday gift, every anniversary card. Maniac pixie dreamy girl, he whispered. What? Jorge whispered back. Sure, Bill announced to the room. I'll play along. The Elmo doll shifted, as if on a fishing line. I once doubted doubted my my own own senses, senses, Mr. Stewart. Stewart. I I was was remiss. Sorry, Bill said to the toy. He flashed Alberta a look. This is great. She shook her head at him. My My name name was was Scrooge, Scrooge, the old doll said. And I I lived lived a life life of avarice and solitude. solitude. But before the end, I had my eyes opened, and I did all that I might to uphold the beatitude of Christmas every day of the year. You're not in hell, then? Bill asked, concealing a smirk. I... You were a greedy old bastard, mean to everyone around you your whole life. Cheating poor people out of the... I never cheated people. I was a fair man! The doll rasped, sitting up. I don't know, Bill continued. Even today, your name is used to mean somebody who hates Christmas, not holds it high every day of the year. Alberta opened her mouth to shut Bill up, but a despairing sound issued from the doll. (gasps) Yes, the Elmo toy said in resignation. And that has been a hell in itself, I assure you. To know that I might have brightened the lives of so many, young and old, stranger and dear, but that I did not. Oh, there are times when I... But you're there in heaven now? I never said I was in heaven, said the doll. So you did go to hell then? Bill asked, excited. How's Robin Williams doing? You talk to him much? I... I am not not of your time. time. I do not... not. Don't antagonize the ghost, Bill, Jorge said, a bit more fear in his voice. You... Whispered Alberta, shaking her pretty head. You still don't believe? After all this? Well, Alberta... He began, then stopped. The look on her face was... Well, it was aghast, shocked, a little disgusted. I take it this sort of thing always happens when you mess around on the Ouija board? No. She said frankly. It's always spelled out words before. One time there was like a wind that blew through the room, but never like this. Oh, he said, still not quite buying it. But was Alberta that good an actress? To fake all this and believably fake both dread and outrage... He didn't think so. Bill slowly turned in his seat toward the Elmo doll. It was standing up a few feet away. Standing. He saw no puppeteer, no strings, not anything that might be controlling it. Its eyes turned toward him, fixed right on him. Mr. Stewart! The doll said, I have defied the immutable rules of the afterlife to address you this night. Bill was pretty sure Alberta didn't know what immutable meant. Heck, he wasn't sure himself. The holiday is dear to me, and to my friends, Bob Cratchit, his son Tim, my nephew Fred, and Alice Sim, the lovely widow I met and wed before the end of my life. Tiny Tim is with you? Jorge asked, childlike wonder in his tone. Not so tiny anymore. Another man's voice spoke through the doll. This voice was an adult and distinctive, but also English. Beside them are the four good spirits that helped me open my eyes, Mr. Stewart. Scrooge slash Elmo said. Why would you care? Bill asked meaning not just Scrooge, but all of them. Because I see in you, young master, a spark of who I was at your age. 
Much more indolent, of course, but nearly all your generation is, I fear. Don't guilt the boy, Ebenezer, a woman's voice said through the doll. Yes, yes, said Scrooge. Though your flaws are known to us, and there are many, we see it not as a drudgery, but a cheery diversion to speak to you this night. It is our pleasure to spread glad holiday tidings to one who has gone astray, as the kind spirits did to me all those years long past. The holidays are more than an arbitrary and incorrect observance of a holy child's birth, but are a season when one can hold dear those close to them, feel thanks for all the blessings one enjoys, and take notice of the downtrodden, of the misfortunate, of the dour, hopeless, hungry, and lonely. You might give of your time, your money, your talents, or just your presence to lift a share of darkness from a world that is rapidly entering full eclipse. I wish, even from my situation in the great beyond, that I might have come to my understanding when I was but a youth as you are. Oh, the friends I might have had, the good I might have wrought, the orphans, the cripples, the infirm, the poverty-stricken, the old and the young, that I might have touched with my wealth and brilliant mind. I might have been another Aristotle, another Lincoln, another Buddha. I might be known as Saint Ebenezer, instead of, as you pointed out, a sad epithet to call one who lacks Christmas cheer. The doll paused then, giving Bill a moment to think about that. He vaguely remembered one of his religious friends saying that a woman in the Bible, Jesus' sister or something, was always called a whore, even though it didn't say so in the Bible. And he had done a report in a junior high class about how Lizzie Borden, the famous axe murderess, had been found not guilty. But everyone still said she killed her parents, even today. That would suck. I'm... I'm sorry, he said. Then, said the ghost, perhaps you are not past saving. That felt nice, actually, to hear Scrooge say that. It was kind of a cool thought that anybody cared about him or his feelings, let alone his best pal's girlfriend or a famous dead guy. As I strove to undo the damage of a lifetime of obstinacy, the spirit said, there were several who cursed me as past saving, who called me a calloused, wrinkled sinner who only changed his heart due to deathbed re-evaluation. And many laughed to see me giving to the orphan's fund, donating to the beautification of my soot-stained city, striving to increase the quality of the hospitals that treated both the physically wounded and the mentally ill. But no good thing is done in this world, except that someone gets a laugh from it. You will find this to be so, if you will but soften your heart and embrace the season. What good can I do, Mr. Scrooge? I'm not a millionaire like you were. Please call me Ebenezer, for we are two of a parallel stripe, young man. And I was as poor as a ghetto church mouse when I started out, having been given naught from my father but a bitter temperament. But if you're as smart as I was... He's not, Jorge said, and was ignored. You can become something, rise from your station, and spread influence as you wind your way through life. Bill was flattered, but what could he do? I'm just a barista, Mr. Ebenezer. A what? A coffee seller? Well, then grind your beans and brew your foul concoction with generosity and with a smile. You'll see it reflected in the people you encounter night and morning. And even if you see it not, we will see it and bless you for it. Uh, all right, Bill said, and he was smiling. He wasn't a religious guy, but he wasn't a total douche, 
and he supposed he could try giving back a little this holiday season. Besides, he liked the snow and the lights and had a weird fondness for that old Christmas date rape song about how cold it was. Plus, here it was. Actual proof of life after death, communion with the afterlife, and a conversation with a true authority when it came to selfishness, regret, and ultimately, redemption. My time is now short, the Elmo doll said. Promise me, Mr. Stewart, to strive at least to keep the spirits of Christmas past, present, and future in your heart, so that if it be said of you when your life reaches its end, that if any man knew how to keep Christmas well, it was Bill Stewart. Bill nodded, laughing, and feeling tears burning at his eyes. That sentiment touched him deeply. He couldn't say why, but the thought of people remembering him, recalling his goodness, even after he was long gone, spoke to him. <laughs> I will. There's a good boy, said Scrooge. I can see now, Mr. Stewart, that your eyes have been opened. It gives me peace to know that my words, my example, my life can still inspire joy in others. Thank you, Mr. Scrooge. Bill said, sniffling. Yes, thank you, Alberta exclaimed. Bill looked away from the doll and across the table. Alberta was weeping quietly, her chest heaving as she tried to control her emotions. Jorge sat there, stunned, his face visibly pale, even in the low light. For some reason, that gave Bill an idea. He turned back to the Muppet. Hey, put Tim on, he said quickly. Very well. There was an unmistakable shuffling sound. Yes. God bless us, everyone, Bill said. And the spirits laughed. (laughs) A moment later, the lights flickered again, and the Tickle Me Elmo went limp on the floor as if its unseen strings had been cut. It toppled forward onto the old rug. The shadows, so atmospherically spooky at first, now faded away as the room brightened. Whatever presence had been in the room was now absent. Jorge took his hand from out of his girlfriend's and wiped it on his pant leg. (laughs) Wow! Alberta managed, still sniffling. She used her sleeve to wipe at her running nose, the only unattractive thing she'd probably done all day. Yeah, well, I was right, Bill said, dabbing at his own moist cheek. Not all his Christmas memories were bad ones. The times making snowmen, sledding in the country, trying hard to ice skate, dating Wendy when the world seemed hopeful and filled with potential. But he had lost that hope, just as he'd lost Wendy. But here, now, with evidence that life continued after this brief sojourn of tears. Well, that was pretty hopeful, wasn't it? Suddenly, he was filled with something, a sensation of warmth, of optimism, of possibility, a feeling that just might have been the spirit of Christmas. Thank you so much for that... that experience. Alberta sighed. She was beaming, proud of herself. Jorge stood on wobbly legs. He seemed out of it, not moved, just scared. Jorge? Bill asked, getting concerned. I need a drink, he said quietly. And how? Bill exclaimed, finding himself almost giddy. What does and how mean? Alberta asked. Bill really wanted to embrace the young woman, but felt a little strange about it, her being his best friend's girl and all so he put his arm around both of them. That was wild. Alberta got the Ouija board's box off of the floor and folded the board in half, holding it gently like an antique or a sacred text. Jorge stared at the Tickle Me Elmo on the floor, eyeing it like quite the opposite. Guys, Jorge suggested, let's not tell anyone about this. What? Why? Alberta looked hurt. 
Because. His eyes shifted to his friend, who had put his jacket back on and was looking dreamily around the room. We'll talk later, he mumbled. All right. Alberta thought that was true, but not the conversation he was picturing. Come on, let's go, Jorge said, and grabbing his coat, moved straight for the door. I've got to put the game away and the chair... It's obviously not a game, is it? Jorge snapped, and it was immediately clear how close to some kind of breakdown he was. I said I wanted to go! Okay, I'll clean this up later, she said, and they hurried to the attic's exit. She turned off the lights, and the three of them went down the stairs. A moment later, however, Bill came back up the stairs, a spring in his step. He opened the attic door and turned on the lights again. He'd taken out his keys at some point, and luckily, he'd felt for them when Alberta jingled her car keys, realizing his were gone. They were on the bookshelf, right beside a couple of antiquated encyclopedias. A little hanging mirror reflected a contented look on his face. He glanced toward the Ouija board box on the big table. And that's when the lights flickered again. The pointer spun around like a child's top, and a voice spoke from behind him. Bill jumped and turned. The Elmo doll was standing once again. What a display, it said. This was also a British dialect, old-fashioned and high-class, just like on TV. Hello? Bill asked, a bit nervous again. Are you that young chap who was just now interacting with the great beyond? Uh, that's me. I know not how best to tell you this, the new voice said through the doll's mouth. But you've been the victim of a distinctly elaborate, rather brazen ruse. I have? Bill's breath caught in his chest. He had suspected at first, but... Yes. I'm afraid Ebenezer Scrooge was a fictional character. He was? Indeed. Made up out of whole cloth, like the lot of them. Jacob Marley, Bob and Tim Cratchit, the spirits. They're all from a novella called A Christmas Carol. And that sounded familiar to Bill. I... I am surprised, said the doll. You couldn't tell fact from fiction. Immediately, Bill Stewart recognized the truth when he heard it. The wind went out of him, a leak in a hot air balloon. Furthermore, my good man, there is no communing with the afterlife. Witch boards are hokum. There are no spirits. No, I... Bill's lip quivered. His hopes were scattering. He felt like he had as a seven-year-old boy, hearing his mommy and daddy were not going to be together anymore. But of course there weren't. It was all fabricated out of greed or fear. But it had all seemed so real. It felt so real. Bill found it hard to keep standing. His knees had turned to ramen noodles. But still, he asked, You're sure? Of course, the voice said, softer now, not at all accusatory. No one would know better than I. I'm the famed author of the 19th century, Charles Dickens. The End Have you ever known someone named Desmond? Desmond? Yeah. I've never known that person, but I've heard of a few people named Desmond. You yeah. have? I've heard of Desmond before, but where's hell? I don't know that I know anybody named that. I, want, I can't think of who it was, but there was a football player named Desmond. Desmond Howard, I want to say, something like that. Well, there was a, uh, an R&B singer named Desmond Child in the 80s. Do you remember him? I don't. And that's the only Desmond I ever knew. Okay. Let's stop wasting uh, outtake space and move on. 
All right, everybody, welcome back. I hope you enjoyed the story. You got a quick cast list for us, uh, Rich Outfield? I don't know. I, 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 I'm fairly sure you and I voiced most of it. Okay. Oh, oh okay. Alistair, what was the girl's name? Alberta was voiced by, uh, I think her name was Kelly Kapowski. Does that sound right? Um, I think uh, I think you're thinking of the wrong person. Kelly Kapowski was uh, one of the characters uh, on Saved by the Bell. Really? Yeah. What? Uh, That's I, weird. I've, I've never watched Saved by the Bell. How would I know that? I don't know. That's... Uh, the power of pop culture, I guess. I guess. Oh well, what, who am I thinking of then? I I think you must be thinking of Tina Kolakowski. Wait, no, no, that's the one that was the tomboy, that was in Showgirls, right? <laughs> the the one that could never have worked in this town again. <laughs> well, her name was Jessie on the show. That's all I remember. Oh, okay. I don't know what so, the actress's name was though. Maybe the actress was named Tina Kolakowski. Who did Tina play? Tina? On Saved by the Bell. On Saved by the Bell? She played the math teacher. No, I have no <laughs> idea. Uh, sorry. Uh, okay. So back, back to the show, y'all. Um, <laughs> so Tina was the, the other cast member, right? Right. Tina Kolakowski. Alberta was her name? It was Alberta, yes. Oh, wow. Does that horrify you? That's an awesome name. Yet yeah, you didn't have a problem with Desmond. No. Why would I have a problem with Desmond? Desmond is not the state, the province that my wife grew up in, so... Okay. It's like naming somebody California, but worse. <laughs> it's not worse. <laughs> uh, surely Alberta is a girl's name. <laughs> no? It is. I think there were some people named Alberta back in 1905. <laughs> you bastard. It's probably named after, like, the girl you had a crush on in high school, isn't it? She was named after Albert Finney, actually, but uh, that's, that's, that's neither here nor there. Oh, okay. Yeah, let's just keep talking about this stuff so we don't have to talk about the story itself, all right? Uh, okay. So, Jorge, then. Yeah, Jorge. Named after Jorge C. Scott. Oh, okay, nice. You and I had talked about that Jorge thing. Whether we should pronounce it George or Jorge, right? Yeah, yeah, you were at, you were asking. I mean, they joked with him in the story itself, and called his said his name the regular the 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 American way versus the uh, how do you what would you call that? You can't say the American way versus the whatever way because that's like racist or something. <sighs> Why is everything racist? Is it okay to say the versus the Hispanic way or the Spanish way? The Latino the way? Spanish. That's what I should say. The English way versus the Spanish way. Ah, that's there you I'll go. Say. And that way you only offend those that want to be offended. Yeah, it's just languages, so they can't yell at me. Are, so were these all named after actors that played Scrooge? I, I don't, yes, I'm not exactly. Familiar, I'm not familiar with Albert Finney. Yeah, there was there was a musical in the the sixties called Scrooge, and he played Scrooge in that. Okay, is that who Bill was? Bill was Bill Murray. It was. Good job. Okay. <laughs> Interesting. All right, that's always fun to try and figure out what you've named things after, because you have some kind of a plan. There was a story that we ran on here once many moons ago where all the characters were named after the hottest chicks that you just <laughs> had a thing for. But yeah, it was all actresses. It wasn't just like the girl down the street. Right, right. Yeah, it wasn't. The, oh, sorry. I should, I should yeah, amend that. The hottest actresses that you had things for. And uh, it took me a while before I figured out, oh, wait, that's what that is. <laughs> yeah, once you realized there was a character named after Angela Lansbury, you were just like, ah, now I know what he did. <laughs> yep. But it was fun from there on out to try and figure out each time another character gets mentioned. Okay, what actress is this? So do you really want to just avoid talking about the story itself? I, You're supposed to give an author's note, you know. I, I know I'm supposed to. I, we've talked in the past about what would we do if an author ever didn't give us an author's note. And we'd probably talk for 10 minutes about 
Why isn't it weird that in all the episodes we've done, nobody's ever not given us an author's note? Anyhow. Oh, no. well, that, that reminds me. Stephen King came out with a book called The Bizarre of Bad Dreams this year. Uh-huh. And it's another one of his uh, collections, you know, of short stories. Right. Um, and in the introduction, let's see if I can grab it right here since I'm, I've got it in my hand. He wrote, uh, Some of these stories have been previously published, but that doesn't mean they were done then, or even that they're done now. Until a writer either retires or dies, the work is not finished. It can always use another polish and a few more revisions. It says, you know, that's kind of a delightful thing about still being alive, as you can continue to do that, as our, our friend George Lucas could probably attest. <laughs> yeah, that's what I was going to say. When I read that, I was just like, whoa, that's, that seems odd to me. Because, you know, we had talked about, well, once your story is published, once it's out there, it's kind of done. It's in people's hands, and you can't change it again. You can't fix it. Or if there's this plot hole, you know, in the third chapter, that plot hole is always going to be there because people bought it. But if Stephen well, King... Well, it's going to be there in the books that those people bought, but... You know, they have first editions and then later editions where often they'll go through and fix typos and stuff, so. And then, of course, there's some people who completely redo it. Like Orson Scott Card did A Planet Called Treason and then totally rewrote it and published it again years later, just called Treason, right? Yeah. I'm not as familiar with his stuff as I am with Stephen King's. I, I wonder if he just hated that first draft or he owed his publisher another book and he's like well here's what i'm gonna do or if you know he signed on with a new publishing company and he's just like okay here's what i'm gonna do i think what he did he did that later when they like yeah hey, you owe us a new book and he's like well, okay well i'll just do ender's game again from a different character's point of view that'll only take me like a week oh jeez. <laughs> Imagine it's just taking you a week to write a book. <laughs> That's a uh, Chris Monroe does, I think. Anyway, how I was kind of inspired by that. I was like, "Wow, that's that's cool." I I sort of felt like things were set in stone once you release something. Just like you know, when you make a movie and you release it, that movie's not yours anymore. Uh -huh. The Star Wars that came out in 1977 belongs to us. It's not George Lucas's anymore. <laughs> So when he's like, well, I never liked that audience. It's like Han Solo. So I had to change this. And, you know, it's like, wait, no. We embrace this movie like no other movie, guy. And and we loved Han Solo. Why why would you do this? Anyway, it just made me think, well, I, I guess I could fix Present of the Christmas Ghost if I wanted to. Yeah, you could if you wanted to. You know what you could actually do because of this uh, sudden revelation that Stephen King gave you? What's that? You could take all those stories that you keep saying, oh, it just needs one more pass, and you can just put it out. And then you could do another pass later if you get the time. But people could be, like, buying it, and it could be, like, earning you money in the meantime. What do you think of that idea? Well, let's not get ahead of ourselves. I mean, earning me <laughs> money, geez. That's crazy. <laughs> Sir. That is crazy talk. I don't know what I was thinking. But okay, so we weren't able to go to your house, and I can't remember what happened. We just recorded the story in your car, and uh, oh, it's just you know the time got short. You told me you weren't going to be in town for the holidays. You're going out of town, and it's like, oh shoot, what? When are we going to do this Christmas episode? And the answer was, well, we got to do it that night to give us time to edit the Christmas episode. Right. Uh, and so we just recorded what i had written and i was horrified while we were going i was just like oh geez oh no there's a typo oh no this is worse than a typo i repeat the same information twice in the story oh no even worse than repeating information this joke wasn't funny oh no and i just yeah i was depressed to be honest so like wow this story is terrible this is so sad because you know how it is. There are things in your head where it's like, oh, that's going to be really funny or that's going to be really scary. The idea of a ghost speaking through a Tickle Me Elmo doll was so amusing visually in my mind. But I wasn't able to convey that with text. You know what I mean? It, 
and uh, yeah sometimes that is a problem with text it's 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 not the same as a movie and it doesn't always work the same but yeah i was just bummed about that and then i read that stephen king quote and i was like oh well maybe maybe all is not lost maybe i can learn from my mistakes take the things that i don't like while i'm editing the story and and i can fix them and yeah so, you could even cut sentences and things out while you're editing uh, what people will hear today like originally sh she arranges the table for them to do the ouija board reading and then a minute later, she arranges the table for them to do the Ouija board reading. And I was just like, no, she just she did just, that. And she's so, just fussy. She, she, she just has to arrange it to be exactly perfect. <laughs> she's just fussy. Hey, who did the voice of Alberta? <laughs> Kelly Kapowski. <laughs> That's right. No, no, you're thinking of somebody else. No, I think it was... It was the black chick from Saved by the Bell that, that you're thinking of. The, oh. Jason Voorhees' illegitimate daughter. Saved by the Bell coming back to haunt us again. Yeah, no, it was Tina Kolakowski. And she played the math teacher on Saved by the Bell? Is that how that worked? <laughs> right. Uh, she was on last the, la the last episode. She was the voice of Lady Justice. <laughs> and I want to say some somebody else as well. I can't remember what. That's cool. Yeah, we talked about that, right? That we did that over Skype and that I wanted to do it again. Yeah, it's fun. We, we, we will do that. That's for sure. Yeah, in the new year, uh, let us know if you guys want to do one of those because I, I thought we could do another barbecue sketch just that way, just over Skype. Whoever happens to be there gets to do the offensive dialogue. <laughs> All right, so talking about this story. Okay. What was your inspiration? Why did you write a, this story, The Present of the Christmas Ghost? I don't know. <laughs> I'm old and grouchy and the holidays don't do anything for me anymore, I guess. And I don't know. I just I liked the idea of somebody who's not got the Christmas spirit gaining the Christmas spirit. I mean, you know... You, We've all seen like Hallmark Hall of Fame movies where it's like Tom Bosley doesn't like the holidays. Get off my lawn! But this Christmas, something special is going to happen. Who are you? I'm an angel. Hallmark presents the Christmas Angel. You know, that kind of stuff. And I just thought it would be fun to do that to do a guy that, that that doesn't have the christmas spirit then he gets the christmas spirit uh -huh. and then at the end of the story i say f you because oh my <laughs> gosh the ending of this story is such a giant f you that i i hope to get lots and lots of hate mail <laughs> and yeah i i wrote a story that only you liked years ago called subtext that had the exact same ending to this story and for some reason, you just loved that. Do so you know what I'm talking about? Do you remember how you liked that story and nobody else did? I didn't realize that nobody else did, but I did. I loved it. Well, even I didn't like subtext. I was just like, no, it's, it's kind of a cool idea. And then it ends with a giant F you. And you're like, no, that was what was cool about it. And I'm like, okay. I, I, I you love know, I, F you endings. And so I was just like, F, F you, you, the, the sequel. sequel. I don't know. Did you feel that the ending was a giant F you too? It's F U two. Yes, that's right. F U two. Is it too late? You didn't like the title. Let's change it. I like the title. I just didn't get it until now. <laughs> oh my gosh, it's mixed around. The words are mixed around. I just got it now. Mr. Belding. <laughs> Mr. Belding. <laughs> that was the principal, right? I believe so. I, I think he was a principal. Maybe he was just a teacher. I don't know. See, I'm not that big of a fan of Saved by the Bell. I don't even <gasps> have any of the merchandise or any of the shirts like you. So. <laughs> Piece of crap. It's not a shirt from <laughs> Saved by the Bell. <laughs> oh, now, you, you have told me before that your favorite book, and I don't know if it counts as a book, but they sell it as a book, so it should count, <laughs> is... Lady Chatterley's Christmas. Lover, yes. <laughs> yes. Oh, 
It was Sorry, The Christmas no. Carol by <laughs> yeah. Darl's Chickens. The famous Dutch author? That's right, Edmund Wells. That's the truth, right? That I'm not remembering this wrong? No, Yo, you're remembering it right. I love that book, yeah. I used to try and read it or listen to an audio of it every single year to like get me into the Christmas spirit and maybe that's why I'm all grouchy about Christmas this year is I didn't I haven't You didn't it. do it yet? I think I have a uh, a version of it read by uh Patrick Stewart. So should I should I send that your way? Well, I've got that too. Oh, okay. And yeah, I used to back in the days of cassettes, I would listen to that every single Christmas and cuz I had the cassette even better, I have a version of uh, Great Expectations read by Frank Muller. So should, do you want me to send that along to you then? Well, it depends. Is it G-R-A-T-E Expectations, <laughs> also by Edmund Wells, the famous Dutch author? Yes. Oh, yes. Then by all means, send it to me. Uh, anything read by Frank Muller is going to be a fun listen. Um, yeah. I, oh, gosh. I love, I love A Christmas Carol. And it... Uh, I mean, it's super, super iconic, and every single show has done their rip-off of it or parody of it or homage to it. <laughs> You've seen that uh, the episode of The Simpsons where he watches, Homer watches... Uh, Mr. Magoo's Christmas. Mr. Yes, Mr. Magoo's Christmas Carol, and he's like, oh my gosh, it was the most amazing... This All this stuff happened, and like Lisa and Bart are like, Dad... You've never seen this before? It's the Christmas Carol. Everybody's seen this. Every show has ever has done this. He's like, what? Somehow he's missed it all these years. Yeah, it's it's just it's a really, really big deal. And and so this was sort of mine, I guess, in a way. I got to have Scrooge be a character and I don't know. I just wish the story had come out better. <laughs> Probably too long. Well, it's too long. I enjoyed the story, and I thought there was a lot of fun jokes and uh, interesting things. Now, here is my question for you. Uh oh. Maybe, maybe uh, this should be obvious, or maybe everybody else is going to hit me over the head for not getting it right away. So they get on the Ouija board. <laughs> okay. Yes. And they contact something. <laughs> yes. And the whole time, they're like, oh, I'm Scrooge. And, you know, that's who they're supposedly wanting to contact. But Scrooge can't answer, obviously, because it's not a real thing. Oh, yeah. See, I should have put a warning at the beginning of the story that it, it requires a certain suspension of disbelief. You have no, to overlook. I'm not finished yet. You have to overlook a certain <laughs> giant plot hole for the story to work. Okay, you're not finished. Go ahead. And then, of course, later they talk to Charles Dickens, who tells you that <laughs> there is no afterlife and ghosts aren't real, which, of course, is, has to be funny coming from a ghost that tells you this. So obviously what we're actually talking with is some kind of evil spirit that is just messing with people for fun. It's having its own little Christmas fun. Right? Am I right? Did I get it? I I don't think so. I, I just, I told you, it's just F you, man. Sub, a longer <laughs> version of the ending of subtext. Because, okay, you remember subtext ending, right? Yeah. Where, okay, the, the cell phone, the calls are coming from this girl's coffin. She's alive. She's alive down there. Or, sorry, the, the texts are coming. And so they dig her up. And it's like, oh, you know what? The battery is dead on the cell phone. So this has all been a waste of time. <laughs> Yeah, they say it couldn't have been her. The battery's dead. The end. And it's, yeah, it's just <laughs> F you. You're just like, well, what are you talking about? There were texts coming from the... Who cares if the battery's dead? But that's not the point of the story. The point is F you. <laughs> well, there you go. And okay, that's so, what this one so, is. This is a Christmas F you. So what you're saying is I'm thinking too much about it. <laughs> I like that you're thinking actually... about it, that you're trying to come up with an ending. But yeah, it, it was just sorry again yes very uh, just supposed to be a mean cruel ending and yeah originally <laughs> dickens was much meaner to the the kid and he you know called him old time british slang for you know a, a, an idiot and stuff for b buying into this. he called him a jack and apes no but if i knew what that was i would put it in there 
I just happened to see an episode of, this, again, The Simpsons just the other day where uh, old Monty Burns pulls out one of his really old-timey phrases. He talks about things that, you know, people in the 20s, the 1920s <laughs> uh, knew what was, but, you know, obviously nobody anymore does. He was calling the workers of his plant jackanapes. <laughs> That's funny. Is it you that's always telling me about the when you realize another old timey reference that Monty Burns says? Right. Like when he answers the phone. What does he say when he answers the phone? <laughs> he says, Ahoy hoy. That's what it is. Ahoy hoy. And you explained that to me that when Alexander Graham Bell was developing the phone, that there was an argument as to whether you should say hello or ahoy hoy when you answer the phone. <laughs> Yep. And Ahoy Ahoy was sort of just forgotten in favor of hello over the years. But Monty Burns is so old, he still says Ahoy Ahoy. Yep. So Dickens was just like that. I just busted out some 17th century, uh, 18th century, right? Dickens was 18th century? He was 19th century. It wasn't that long ago. Oh, yeah. Sorry, I'm, I, I was thinking 1800s when I said 18th century. 19th century. I forgot that they're always one ahead. We're in the 21st century. How do you like that? What? Isn't it almost over? In the blink of an eye, I mean, we just, yeah, lived our whole lives. It's almost over for you. Oh, thank goodness. <laughs> okay, so yeah, I was just trying to get confirmation of my theory as to what was going on. But, uh, but yeah, so but it was just a middle finger, and I didn't realize that. You like it better the, that it wasn't actually the ghost of Dickens that he spoke to at the end? <laughs> They're telling him that there is no afterlife. <laughs> that just makes me laugh. <laughs> I'm sorry. It's just so cruel. I... Anyway, so a ghost appears to you and says, Don't believe in ghosts. They don't exist. Right. Take it from me. I'm a ghost. I know. Uh, yeah, that's that's exactly how it was. Uh, do you like the Christmas Carol? I do like the Christmas Carol, although I have to admit, it's funny that your favorite book is Charles Dickens' Christmas Carol, because my favorite book is also Dickens, but not Christmas Carol. It's Great Expectations. I think that's interesting that the two of us both like Dickens. Put Dickens in, in number one. Well, one of the things that nobody ever talks about, about the Christmas Carol is just how sad it is of, you know, looking back at your life and all of the missed opportunities and, and Scrooge has burned all of his bridges and nobody is going to mourn him. You know what I mean? Uh huh. I mean, it's, it's really dark. And, and my favorite part of the book is when the ghost of Christmas past shows Scrooge and the love of his life. And she says, Another idol has displaced me, a golden one. And she gives him back his ring or, you know, breaks off their engagement and says, you know, may you be happy in the life you have chosen. That To me, that's the coldest, most damning line, a sentence I've ever read in a book. May you be happy in the life you've chosen. I just, oh, every time I hear that, I just weep, man, for this guy and you know, we've all got our regrets and, and bridges that we crossed and that we could never go back. But yeah, that sort of thing. And to be shown that while you're an old man, back when you were young. And, and I don't know, I, there's, there's so much regret in that character of Scrooge. We always focus on, you know, on, on how nasty he is. And he's delightfully nasty. Of You know, just a, if I had my way, everyone who goes about with Merry Christmas on their lips would be boiled in their own pudding and buried with a stake of holly through the heart you know all those they yeah, just he's so unrepentantly bad <laughs> that it's delicious but uh he's also got all of those mistakes that he's made that he's has to has to live with that have left him alone so it was just kind of neat for me to be able to write scrooge you know and just kind of imagine what happened to scrooge after the spirits came and give him that little thing i gave him a, a wife and a happy ending and you know uh-huh we talked about it last week our last episode anyways on our last show you know was all about time travel and we were talking about just the 
the opportunity to go back to some point in your in your life and and change something so that you did something the way you you, you now feel you should have and uh the christmas carol is kind of a, a time travel book where you don't get to go back and change anything you just get to go get back and see yeah see you screwed this up See, you did this wrong. See, oh no, 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 look, oh, you, you're just getting to see it. You can't change it, sorry. We're just, we're just, you know, they can't even see us. Okay, so see, you did this wrong. <laughs> and then in the end, all he gets to do is change the present, which when it comes down to it, that's what you do get to change. So it's got a good message. It's one of those uh, motivational phrases I'm, I'm sure if I thought hard enough about it, uh, Shia LaBeouf probably yelled it in his, in his little tirade about how uh, today's the, the first day of the rest of your life. It's one of those things that you always hear on those motivational things. Yeah, sure, you screwed everything up until now, but now is your chance. You don't have to keep screwing up. Turn it around now. Yeah, I, I, Jacob Marley is essentially damned, right? He's a damned soul that is allowed somehow to come visit Scrooge. And it's always sad to think of, that he doesn't get a happy ending. He, it's too late for him. You know what I mean? And, right. And he, you know, the, those lock boxes and chains that he wears are stuck on him forever. And, you know, and I know that people have written like follow-ups where, you know, Marley is forgiven and Marley gets to, you know, go to heaven or whatever you want to say. And I like that sort of thing. I like the people that have written these sequels to Christmas Carol. Yeah, that's that's one of those things that where you can learn the lesson from the people who made mistakes before you and, and you don't have to make those same mistakes or, you know, maybe you can learn from Scrooge's example and not be not be him. Yeah, there you go. You know what I just realized you should have named Alberta? What? You're going to be angry with me when I tell you. <laughs> Why? Is there a... Oh, Carol? You should have named her Carrie. What? Because of Jim Carrey's awful animated version. Uh, <laughs> I guess so. That's that. Carrie is actually a name. But yeah, I don't tend to think about the Jim Carrey one. I, you and I have both seen it, right? I have seen it. Yeah, I thought it was awful. I wasn't really into it very much at all. But it's not as awful as Jim Carrey's How the Grinch Stole Christmas. Right? I mean, I oh, holy cow, I hate that movie. Uh, I don't know. See, I don't hate that movie like you do. I know that you hate it. With the fire with the, of a thousand hells. Fly, yes. Yeah, the fire. Oh, I was going to say the fire of a thousand suns, but I guess. Oh, okay. Oh, yeah. Hells might be more appropriate. But yeah, I don't hate it like that. The one that I hate is the cat in the hat. <laughs> yeah, not only did it utterly suck, but it also somehow traumatized my child for life. Yeah, he's like 15 <laughs> now, and he still shits his pants anytime anybody mentions the cat in the hat. <laughs> He does, yeah. It's like he was uh, conditioned in a in a Vietnamese POW camp or something like that. Just by watching this movie, it was that bad. So that's the one that I don't like very much. And I have, you know, I, I've pretty much not seen it since the first time that we saw it. But uh, I think we own the Grinch DVD. I think we got it back one day on like day after Christmas sale. They had like a bunch of DVD. They used to, my wife used to do that, go on Boxing Day and uh, get stuff when they were selling it cheap the day after. Although to tell you the truth, I don't think my wife bought it. I think it was my, my sister-in-law. I have this sister-in-law who is the bargain queen. You know, there's people that like do blogs and stuff like that about like the bargains that they get and and they make a living like telling people oh yeah you can get this here and that there because so many people go to their blogs my sister-in-law blows all these people away all you could line them all up and she would destroy them all with the bargains that she gets 
she can't pass one up. She'll go <laughs> on like the day after Christmas and they'll have all these Christmas things that she doesn't need any of this stuff, but she'll buy it anyways because it's so cheap that it's such a good deal. And I think that's how we got the Grinch. We went to her house one day and she's like, oh yeah, I just, I just went to the day after Christmas sale and uh, they had all these and they're really cheap. So I have like four of, of each of them. Do you guys want one? <laughs> and so we wound up with like the Grinch and the Santa Claus and uh, a couple other movies too. I don't remember what. Okay. Sorry, that was a long story to say I don't hate the Grinch that much. I think I hate that Jim Carrey Christmas Carol much worse. I think the problem was the time that that Christmas Carol came out was right in the heart of like, like every second movie that hit the theater was a CG animated film. And wasn't that one made by like Zemeckis where they do the motion capture crap? Yes, like, like Polar Express, right? Yeah. Like Beowulf. <laughs> okay. Nobody remembers Beowulf. Have you ever noticed that? Probably for good reason. But yeah, the, that Polar Express kind of creepiness that that movie had. And it was all the clownish stuff like where Scrooge gets shrunk. Oh yes, I do remember that. There's all sorts of silliness. He's being chased by a cat or something. They had to do something to make kids interested in it because it's, it's not quite a little kid's story. Although sometimes I wonder, I, I try and look, I look at a lot of the movies that I like. Like I saw the George C. Scott Christmas Carol on TV when I was, I don't know how old I was. I want to say like between eight and 10, somewhere around there. Yeah, I'd say you were about nine when that came out. I liked it. I watched it the whole way through. I think we recorded it off the TV and I watched it several years in a row. Um, I was thinking the same thing about It's a Wonderful Life, which is my favorite holiday movie. When did I see that the first time? I want to say it was somewhere around the same age, maybe a little younger. And I loved that movie from the beginning too. So maybe you have to be a little bit older than your average kid that goes to see a computer animated film. I'm guessing that there is a lot more younger kids going to those kind of films, five-year-olds. and So you have to do the goofy stuff, which is a bummer because some stories just aren't made for that. So if they did a live, uh, sorry, not a live action, a motion capture CG, It's a Wonderful Life, you would not be all over that? I would not. If they did, if... With the voice of Channing Tatum as <laughs> George Bailey. What do you think, huh? That sounds about right. It's probably what they would go for. You know my opinion. If you ask me, they don't need to make a remake of anything. Except for maybe the Star Wars prequels. But not really a remake, <laughs> just a redo. You just need to start all over with those. But yeah, I, I'm so just sick and tired. I don't even want to go to the movies anymore because that's all there is. It's remakes, sequels, and grabbing whatever 80s property they can get their hands on and turning it from a TV show into a movie. And then they made a Gem and the Holograms movie, which I don't think anyone went and saw. Did anyone see that? You still there? I guess I'll just wait for him to call back. Oh no, my phone's dead. <laughs> Shoot. Crap. <sighs> I think I lost you there. Okay, yes, time to go. All right, well, I guess we've, uh, we've said our piece. We've come to the end of this episode. Just wanted to thank everybody for listening. Thanks to everybody for a great year. And I guess we'll be back again in 2016. If you liked my story, I appreciate it. If you didn't like it, we'll see how I can revise it. Or uh, I guess it's too late to just destroy the whole thing and pretend it never happened like most of my stories. But oh well. Did what I could. I'm Big Anklevich. Thanks if you've ever donated to the show. You're still free to do so if you'd like. And uh, it's all right because I'm saved by the bell. Merry Christmas, you filthy animal. 
The Dune Steve Audio Fiction Magazine is published under a Creative Commons attribution, non-commercial, no derivatives license. This means that you can share the Dune Steve with anyone you'd like, but you can't sell or change the files. Take two. Alberta nodded in empathy. Mm-hmm. Big bitch. What do some people call it? Big bitch. The <laughs> fuck? <laughs> I remember Christmas being a stressful time as a kid. Jorge said. Should we wait? Yeah, wait until he drives by. With his needle dick truck, as a guy at work called it the other day. Dating Robin when the world oh, seemed... her name was Wendy. Chesty Wendy. <sighs> yeah, I wonder. I'm gonna show you the spirit of Christmas. It's a plate. My grandma has it. <laughs> Wait, was it her grandma they were going to the house of? Her aunt. Aunt. <clears throat> Whatever. My aunt has the plate. Sorry. I totally blew that joke. I'm gonna show you the spirit of Christmas. I was totally hoping they'd find, like, an ugly brown plate in the ant's attic, but that's okay. It's me. Okay. You wait till Needle Dick goes away. <laughs> hey, you sure you want to waste your evening doing whatever this is? Bill asked. Of course. And it's not a waste. No? No, no Santa Claus. Oops. You shut up! We're not gonna make it. Oh, is the battery getting really low? How's your crotch though? Is it nice and warm? Oh, it's it's a feel. <laughs> it's great. Okay. Oh yes, yes. I I, I do see that it's toasty warm. <laughs> what does and how mean? I wish I had a chalupa, I'd eat one here with you. Everyone around me could have a bite or two. I love chalupas, do you love chalupas? Chalupas are good. I could have chalupas, I would want chalupas right here in the woods. We could have a chalupa party, everyone could come. You could come and you could come, but not Prince Cryden, because he is scum. I have on good authority scum. I don't know how to end the song, but chalupa's fun.